Welcome to Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck. Join host Hugh Duffy as he takes you behind the scenes with successful accountants, CPAs, and industry elites in conversations about growing a more profitable business. This podcast is meant to prove that accountant marketing truly does not suck and, in fact, can provide you with new skills to improve your effectiveness so you can learn how to develop a business that you want to run, not a business that's running you. Welcome to Accounting Marketing Does Not Suck podcast. Today's session is with Scott Zarrett, president of CPA Academy. And uh, the reason that uh, we have Scott here is that CPA Academy is the largest provider of CPE webinars to the accounting industry. Today, they have over 235,000 members. They've done over 1,400 recorded webinars. And uh, he's uh, really blazed a new trail, which is why we're going to have him share some of his marketing insights, his experience, how he ended up carving out the niche that he has. And uh, hopefully you can use it. I think you'll find it inspiring, insightful. Um, and uh, quite frankly, Scott's a lot of fun to be with as well. So let's let's kick into it. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, Hugh. It's nice to be here. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. Uh, Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to become an accountant? And most of our list, listeners probably don't realize that you are a CPI, but uh, tell us a little bit about what motivated you to become an accountant to begin. Sure. So I, it really comes from my family history. Uh, my grandfather was an accountant, um, not a CPA, but an accountant. And my father um, was a CPA, now retired. And quite frankly, all the men in my family, I'm not sure what the reason is, but ended up in the accounting profession. And so I had assumed that the apple didn't fall far from the tree. And when I went to school and it was time to pick out my major, uh, I went with accounting and didn't really didn't really think twice. Um, and I think it wasn't until after I graduated from college and, and got my first job that I thought maybe I should have thought a little bit further about this because there were a lot of other areas that I was interested in. But it's just it's the path I went down. And I think what was most appealing to it was not necessarily the thought of working for a public accounting firm, but the idea that whatever business at some point in my life I decided to create, uh, accounting would, of course, come in extremely helpful for understanding the foundation of any business. And so fortunately, I was able to really make the most of my career choice but there were some second there were some second guessing going on especially during the process of studying for that CPA exam then I really then I really had to question my decision I remember calling my dad one day and saying dad why don't you tell me how hard this exam was and he said I I think I forgot first of all but um, he just didn't think about that either so I went down that road and found myself in public accounting right out of college and really uh, it was a great firm. Um, it was a large firm. I grew up in Maryland, and that's that's where I started working for Resnick, Fetter, and Silverman, which was the biggest employer out of the, the D.C. area, and I was there for a few years. And at what point in time did you question it? Was it during the CPA certification testing, or was it uh, when you first started six months into the job? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, on a personal note, I had just come back right after college. I went to, to Europe for about three months and had the time of my life and came back and literally the next day I started studying for the CPA exam. So I don't think anyone can prepare for that jarring of a response. But between that and, and actually starting at the public accounting firm and, and just being so ingrained in details, um, you know, I really, I just felt it may not have been a great fit. You know, my personality is more um, entrepreneurial, more, um, I just have a broader interest and I just, I, I, for whatever reason, I just wasn't feeling inspired by the technical work that I was doing. And so I think the combination of working nonstop, you know, studying for the CPA exam and, um, and, and working a full-time job, man, I was working pretty much seven days a week and it was, it was a rough start. It took me a while, um, really to, to land back on my feet, but, um, out of the gate, I, you know, it was, it was tough. And how long did you stay at Resnick? I was there until I passed the CPA exam. And then I felt I had a little bit more freedom to go and find something that I thought was was more fitting. And I did find a job that really that I really enjoyed uh, immediately after. That was for a company called CSC or Computer Sciences Corporation, a very large company that uh, had a had a large presence in DC because of their government contracting work. And there I started getting into auditing. 
and and having a much broader range of, of daily opportunities. And that I, that I did enjoy. That along with the travel was really a pretty great experience to see the country and, and even get outside of the country. Hmm. Interesting. And so you stayed there how long? Uh, I think another three years. Okay. And then what? And then what? Gosh, then I had a form. I had a pretty uh, – actually, I had an itch. For, for something. I wasn't sure what it was, but I, I, I've been an adventurer for, for my life, for my whole life. And I think what the big game changer for me was in 1999, I came across this opportunity or learned about an opportunity to ride my bike, uh, down the continental divide hmm. from Canada down to Mexico. It was a brand new trail that had been created and I was two and a half thousand miles, um, of a self-supported mountain bike trip, and I, I signed up for it and trained for it and took a took three months off of my job to, to do it. And I think everyone thought I was nuts at the company. That wasn't exactly the path most people followed uh, when they first start a company is to ask for three months off, but they, they granted me permission, and I went on that trip to Colorado. Actually, well, all you know, the entire continental divide, but when I was in Colorado, I just had this epiphany, like, wait a second, I can move here and I could do whatever I want. I'm still young. And so um, it was that was that was the game changer for me. And I actually felt, geez, maybe I should move to Colorado and get a degree in marketing and do what I am excited about. And so after I got back from that trip, my plans went into motion. And that's what I did. I moved out to Colorado where I could be close to um, all the trails and things that I love. And then figured, okay, well, I'll make the career work. You know, I figured Denver was a large enough city where there'd be opportunity. And so it was just a, a few years or a couple of years after moving to Colorado that I had decided, all right, you're on your own. You want to reinvent yourself. What are you going to do? And I really didn't have didn't have a plan. I had a lot of different ideas, but um, it was a stress, very stressful time. Also a lot of fun. I was I had a great social life, but career-wise, I wasn't sure where I was headed. So, um, yeah, I found myself getting quite creative in what I was going to do. And I was very fortunate. I mentioned that that my family is full of accountants. And one of them uh, reached out to me and said, you know, I I understand you're you're in between, you know, opportunities right now. And he proposed an idea for me to sell cost segregation. Um, He was looking to build up a practice within his CPA firm and said, I think this could be a lucrative opportunity. And he wanted to partner with me on that. And so I explored that and thought, I think there's something to this. And I get to actually use the mark, you know, I get to use my CPA um, designation to my advantage. Um, And I get to do creative thinking in terms of coming up with a marketing plan. And that's what we did. It was a very scrappy startup. There was no precedent. I had no experience in marketing um, or sales or most of the things that would (laughs) probably be very helpful for starting uh, down that path, but uh, I went for it anyway, among other things. And and so that was really how I cut my teeth into trying to figure out how are you going to educate CPAs for the purpose of selling services. And so I explored a lot of different avenues and that's really where I learned, I think, the hard way, you know, uh, about uh, everything from making cold calls to coming up with white papers and writing articles and you know, I just there was no there was no plan. I didn't have a um, I didn't have a, anyone that was consult that I was consulting with. I just kind of made it up as as I went along and and did that struggle actually for the very first year trying to figure out how to sell this sell my first cost segregation study. And it did take a year of no success and uh, a lot of hard work and and actually a borderline ulcer I think <laughs> um, before. You know, before that first job was sold, and uh, fortunately, I stuck with it because that really was the most important career move that I had made was taking that chance to try something. And as a matter of fact, I wasn't able to convince them to make that content free. They actually disagreed and said that if you want people to, if you want to sell, you should make sure that others have skin in the game. And that you know that they're not there uh, for free CPE, uh, to be to be blunt. And uh, it was my best offer, and I accepted it. 
and it didn't feel right because I, I did feel that free was, was the way to go. And we, so we started by charging for content. So, um, point is I haven't yet figured it out at this, at this point. And then I realized I was comping just about everybody to come to these classes because if I wanted to sell to them, I didn't want the $45 to be the obstacle for a $10,000 sale. So we started comping everybody everywhere. And then it just finally, I said, guys, what, why are we not comping everyone everywhere? And uh, they, fortunately, they agreed. They, they saw that too. And that's when the light bulb, that's when, that's when things happened. We went from having, I don't remember the number, but I think it was somewhere around 30 people attending a class to having 300 people attend a class. And those extra 270 people, you know, you just need one sale out of those folks to, uh, to make it work. And it more than made up for the lost revenue on, on selling CPE. And so that was... Uh, that was quite a moment, quite a discovery was when we we had agreement on that and it worked and we sold a lot and we kept growing and growing. And um, we hit about 20, we processed about 25,000 registrations, not about, it was 25,000 registrations. I remember that number being mind blowing to me at the time, 25,000 registrations for cost segregation classes. And I thought that was a lot. It is a lot. If, if there's only, you know, 2,000 working hours in a year and you've got, you know, it's a lot. If any way you look, at it, it's a lot. And so um, it, it really worked. And, and when that light bulb went off, it was so weird because it wasn't, it wasn't like this. I don't know. I, I was actually a friend of mine. And one day I just shot him a note and I was like, I think this thing that we're doing for this one company works for for pretty much every company that you know you that's trying to sell the CPAs, any company that would certainly rent out a space in an exhibit hall uh, would be a, a possible candidate. And it just was one of those moments like I, I I don't I can't figure out why this wouldn't be a why this model of using education to position yourself as a thought leader to sell services wouldn't apply to to just about everybody. And he agreed instantly. I mean, it was like a no brainer. We didn't even call, I didn't even call him. I just emailed him. He's like, yeah, it makes sense. Let's do it. And I was like, yeah, it is pretty obvious that that's, that that's a good model. And uh, I think having someone else validate it like that, uh, who was also on the IT side of things, made me realize this is a, this is, yes, it's a marketing tool, but it's also a software company in, in many ways. And so not, I never went back at that moment. I mean, that was, that was the moment where I realized, you know, I'm a little tired of selling the same thing every day. I've been teaching these same classes for six years. It gets pretty boring to hear yourself say the same thing for six years and be so limited in what you're talking about. And while I enjoyed the process of building out this LMS, essentially, this learning management system using WordPress, it was still highly inefficient. And... I felt that there was so much opportunity for, for really um, creating a single share platform where all types of content could be found. I mean, did I know how to get there? I mean, absolutely not. I had, I had already pulled off a miracle that I, that I was able to sell effectively for a company and be able to do what I was doing in a pretty short period of time. But the idea of going off on my own and creating this platform uh, that didn't exist, uh, that was that was pretty horrifying. Uh, but on the other hand, I think, I mean, how many people do you, do you hear talk about an idea that they wish that, that they knew was so smart, but they just never, they never decided to pull the trigger and, and they regret it. And I just thought, I don't need to, I don't need to be like that. So Scott, how Scott. long did you invest into the commercialization of your idea? How long did you kick it around, think about it before it came out and it became, okay, I'm going to give up my, my paying job, and mm -hmm. this is what I'm going to do. How long did you kick that around? Mm, gosh, you know, I don't. It's a great question. I don't remember the exact. Uh, for those of you who have had kids, you know that your memory is a little fuzzy uh, around those time frames. At least mine was. Um, it was at least a year and a half of due diligence, and that, that time was not kind of like poking around. It was intense. Um, it was burning, you know, the candle at both ends. It was, um, 
you know, doing all the things that you're supposed to do, a SWOT analysis. Uh, I mean, I, I would say that from that day I told you, I emailed a friend of mine. Um, it never waned. It just, it just picked up steam. And I'm sure some of that time was unproductive in retrospect, but uh, I obsessed essentially uh, until I quit my job, which was uh, this will sound weird. Uh, about a week was exactly one week before my first son was born. So it's easy for me to remember how old my business is because he was born on February 6th of 2012. And so that was that was really when uh, this world became a totally different one to me um, when I quit my job. And um, I remember working on it, very, uh, <laughs> working in the emergency room, waiting for, for <laughs> the birth. I mean, I was working nonstop. Um, my honeymoon, uh, embarrassed to say I was working on my honeymoon. No, I get, I get the motivation. I really do, especially with the responsibility. How, since our listeners don't think about how large the education market is for the accounting space here in the U.S., it's probably yeah. the first thing you try to tackle and get your arms around. How big a business is it in dollars? Well, that's a that's a great question, and and I didn't address that, but I, I talked about the due diligence part where you're trying to prove out the business model. And even though my background is uh, as a CPA, I am a CPA, and I had experience in using CPE to my advantage um, with specifically cost segregation. When I decided, even after I had sent my buddy the note and said, "Why aren't why aren't we doing this?" One of the first things that that we did on that on that SWOT analysis was go, okay, well, CPAs, we know is one option, but what about real estate folks? What about attorneys? What about architects? Uh, there's a lot of professions out there that have CPE. And so we put together a spreadsheet. How many hours per year uh, does each require? Um, how many people are in each profession? What's the, what's the nature of people? Like, for example, doctors don't sit at home and watch webinars. They go to the hospital and watch them with their colleagues. Um, real estate people, quite social, don't want to sit at home and watch webinars. They want to go to someone's office and sit around and talk, you know, and connect. CPAs, uh, definitely good contenders, uh, very happy to be at home in their office, uh, taking technical content 40 hours per year. There's 600,000 plus of them. And when you, when you do the math on all of them, 600,000 plus CPAs with 40 hours per year continuing education requirements is 24 million there alone. There is nowhere that I'm familiar with that will tell you, I don't think there's anywhere that, it, that it's recorded, out of the 24 million hours that are required by active CPAs, what percentage of people are taking that in a live setting, self-study or group internet based, and how many of them are taking courses within the, you know, provided by colleagues of their own firm, there really isn't. If there is data, please someone send it to me because I can't find it. Um, <laughs> so I've been going blind this whole time and saying there's 24 million hours of continuing yet. That's if people met that just the minimum. And then you've got enrolled agents, you have registered tax return, tax return preparers, right? So that adds up significantly. And then you look at people that take classes not because they need CPE, but they go above the 40 hours. No one knows how many of those folks there are, how many are taking 50 hours. And quite frankly, I don't think people even thought about, a lot of people didn't even think about taking more than 40 hours until they realized that the content was actually enjoyable. It just felt like something they had to check off. And so I don't know the answer. It's more than 25 million, probably more than 40 million. You know, if you count all the enrolled agents, I mean, it, it, it definitely is because they have 24 hours a year or every other year or something. And then there's all the attorneys and small business owners and uh, who else? CFOs, controllers, bookkeepers, you know, a lot of people who don't necessarily need CPE, who need the content. And so it's a pretty, pretty tough to define um, what the opportunity is. But even if you just took 30 million, just say for very, very, very conservative numbers, um, times however much they're used to paying for CPE, uh, it's a lot. It's certainly enough um, to uh, sustain um, my habits, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if I could have a small little piece of that, and you always hear people say things like that. If I could just have 1% um, you, or half a percent, uh, you'd, be, you'd be fine. Um, and I know that's a cliche, but I did feel like that. And I felt like the CPE market, free CPE market, 
was just completely disorganized. So I didn't know. I didn't know what the. I didn't also didn't know what people, what clients would be willing to pay for the opportunity to present. You know, do CPE classes. Really didn't know any of that. No one. No one did. There's no. There's no precedent. So you've become the classic disruptor within the continuing education market for accountants. You know, and and when we think of disruptors, you think of Stephen Jobs, you think of Uber, you think of Netflix, you think of Amazon, you think of Tesla, who's turning the combustion engine upside down what really gave you the confidence that you could really break into this market as a one-man band going up against some large publishers going up against some large states to provide continuing education and some of the other you know existing providers you know there are people you named a lot of my my inspirational figures and they each have uh quite unique stories um but the the classic story of disruption uh defined by uh clayton christensen um is essentially that you start out small and you create something at a very low cost um that is um you know is it, it is not of the highest quality and you build up Right. So Tesla is the exact opposite example. This Tesla did something you, you define Elon Musk as a disruptor, which he is. But it's very unusual that someone starts with the most high end uh, vehicle, for example, and then works their way down to, in his case, the Model 3. It's usually the other way around. You start out with a really uh, inexpensive vehicle like Kia did and then find yourself competing at the luxury market. And so. You know, I was at the low, low, low end. I was at when I first started. It was people that wanted free CPE. I mean, that's the risk is that you're creating a company that's going to be branded as a site full of infomercials. And I haven't gotten really into the business model, so maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But I was starting out not competing against the the large publishing companies. Certainly not. You know, the the um, you mentioned. You know, a couple different. I mean, AICPA is obviously. Uh, is obviously uh, the most respected and, and deservedly so organization. You don't go in. I'd be. I'd have been certifiable to go in thinking that that was my. Um, you know that was my competition. I still don't see it that way. But when I, you have to remember that when I started, it was not because of an interest in disrupting the market. Unlike Stephen Steve Jobs, who, I mean, that is no question that that's what he used. You know, he took he took. Um, quite a lot of pride in that. Um, I came in out of necessity for myself, right? So my story is that I needed a tool for myself to be able to sell. And I found an organization that supported that. And then I felt, well, if this works for me, this should work for others. My goal was not to become a disruptor, not to, um, uh, I don't know, it just wasn't, it wasn't something, it wasn't actually a conscientious thought that I had that I want to go in and disrupt this space. It was like, I just want to show people that you shouldn't have to pay $10,000, which is what the going rate was at the time. And I think still is for some of the publication companies to host a webinar. I just thought, okay, I've done the math here. I know how much it costs to, to, uh, you know, to get a NASBA license, to get go to webinar, to, you know, to acquire lists, uh, to do certain things. And uh, the number does not add up to $10,000. So I know I could do better than that. I don't know how much better. I don't know what I'm going to charge exactly. But I know I could do, I know if, I know I could do better than that. And so when I first started, um, <laughs> I mean, with again, one client is not a lot to start with. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't sure. I, I wasn't sure how sustainable it was going to be. Um, and you know, I mentioned earlier that when I was with KB, um, KBKG was the firm I was referring to. I didn't mention them by name, but that's the company I was with selling cost egg. And I mentioned that 25,000 seemed like an awful lot of registrants. Um, I was proud. I was very proud of that number. But I hit that within maybe six months or so of creating my new company. And then you think, whoa, did I like underestimate this? Because... I thought it was going to take me a long time to get there. And we just hit that extremely quickly. 
And now I'm really starting to wonder what happens when you start mixing all these ingredients together. Did I just, you know, did I create something that was I, did I get it right? You know, you don't know. Um, it sure felt right. And so I think that all, all, all you could focus on is just trying to do better with what you're doing. Um, and fortunately for me, the, Fortunately for me, the, the business model was right. The, um, the, the timing was right. And that allowed me the ability to invest money back into the business, to be able to say no to certain clients that I felt were, were going to help label me as an infomercial site, you know, much against my will. And um, I have to say that I actually wish I had a copy of what my site looked like back in 2012 because I'd probably get a kick out of it. But I, I am proud to say that what we are now versus what we are then is very, very different. Mm -hmm. And it happened uh, slowly, you know, like the expression with children, like the days are slow, the days are slow, but the years are fast. It's one of those types of things where um, I look back and I think, you know, it's a, um, I am, I, I I am very proud of where we are today, but it, it, the site and everything else looks very different than where it started. And we're not a site of infomercials. And that was the number one risk that I think I ran into was that we were going to go create this thing. We'd accept, you know, anyone who had money that was green, um, the, the, the money that is not the speaker. And, uh, you know, fortunately, fortunately it worked out. Um, Scott, let's go back to your business model because that's sure. where the big idea was. It's not charging the attendee. Tell us about how you were able to do this and provide the benefit to the person being educated this wonderful experience free of charge. Yeah, that is that is that that is the critical difference. Um and that really was the, the, the aha moment. And the one that I had back working selling cost segregation when I told you that we went from charging attendees to not charging and recognizing that the, the attendance numbers went up tenfold. So that's the concept is that um, if you want to attract large audiences, then the, con then the content has to be free. I mean, free is what can be free will be free is my favorite quote. And I think we've seen that play out. Um, just about everywhere. Think about why, when's the last time you paid for Wi-Fi. Uh, maybe you have, but probably didn't need to. Um, and the whole concept is what can be free will be free. And so the the basic concept is why are we charging the attendees to take content that's only going to help us when we could remove that barrier, have 10 times the number uh, of attendees and be able to sell ideally 10 times more. Um, and so the, the model was essentially flipped to charging the presenter based on how many attendees come. Now that that model wasn't exactly new to the market because there were publication companies that were charging literally $10,000 to host a webinar and giving that content away for free. The um, so there was nothing there's nothing revolutionary about making content free. As a matter of fact, if you want examples of that, just look outside the accounting profession. So there's I looked at it and thought, why is it taking the accounting profession so long to provide free content? Everyone else is doing it. Like, what is YouTube? Like, what is Khan Academy? What is TED Talks? What are these sites that are amazing? Why are they free and why is our content not free? And so the really the the um, the hardest part was figuring out what people would what presenters would be willing to pay per attendee because that number hadn't been set up before. And so um that just took a little bit of trial and error to figure out what, you know, what someone would be willing to, uh, to pay per person. And also I had to be able to set expectations as to how many people were even going to charge them for. I mean, you know, they, if you're going to say your cost is X dollars per attendee, then the question would be, okay, how many attendees are there going to be? And so uh, a lot of unknowns, but that, that became the business model is we're going to charge the presenter based on a, a setup fee for each unique class. And a per attendee fee based on how many people show up, not how many people sign up, but how many people actually come and listen. And then third, it's going to be a fee for sending out dedicated emails uh, to advertise the class. And so those are th that concept, which started in 2012, has barely changed uh, to this date. There have been other services that have been added, self-study, which we haven't talked about. 
um, is highly complementary towards online education, and so are live conferences. But in a nutshell, 90 plus percent of the business is based on charging presenters based on how many attendees come to the session so they could use that information for lead generation purposes. So uh, in some ways, we're an educational site. In some ways, we're a lead generation site. In some ways, we're a software company. I'm not sure what we are exactly. Um, but I, it's, uh, it is based, I, I think, mostly on lead generation and charging people based on lead. And if you look at our rates based on lead, it's we get told this. Actually, it's kind of heartbreaking when a client tells you, that's really cheap. Uh, then you wonder, did I actually price this right? Um, but fortunately, because of the way we priced it, it allowed me not to just have a few clients, you know, not just have a few clients with deep pockets, but it allowed me to have um, hundreds of clients. So whether it's an extremely large company that does have deep pockets or it's someone who's got no budget, um, it, it, was, it was an appropriate model. And so that's, I think, a huge part of the, the key was coming up with a price that, sure, maybe a little a little less or a lot less than I could have charged some companies, but it's also really expensive for other companies that, that are just getting started like I was. And so I think I hit the right price point from the beginning and didn't have to walk backwards. I didn't have to pivot. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm so tired of hearing that term, companies pivoting. It's like I didn't screw up. In other words, I felt like we got the, the business model right from the beginning. And I get asked that question a lot. Um, you know, what what mistakes did you make? What did you learn? I'm like, I don't know. I just feel like we actually got that right. We got the business model part. We got right. And um, uh, it's led to over three and a half million registrations um, here in 2018. And so, uh, so I think that answers your question. Are you, that- su- are you surprised, Scott, that a formidable competitor hasn't come after you in an effective way? I mean, for the most part, you're still a pioneer out there doing it yourself. There have been small little folks that have kicked around the idea, but nobody really has replicated what you've done in any capacity. Does that amaze you six years later? I've lost sleep over the notion that that I, 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 you read enough stories of other companies getting just wiped into oblivion overnight by someone they didn't suspect coming. You see, You see it all the time. And... I mean, I think again, I'd be crazy not to um, not to think about that. Um, you know, it's it, there's always that risk for every business, and uh, to think that I'm immune to it would be uh, naive. And I think that the thing that you have within your power is the ability to to try to just make yourself as strong as you possibly can. And so, yeah, you know, I've been given, I think, good advice the whole time, which is don't just take profits and stick them in your pocket and count your money, invest back in the business. Um, if, I mean, I could have either invest back in my business or I can invest in the stock market and some other business that I don't know anything about really. And so I've just constantly plowed money back into the business and done the best that I can to make it, uh, to make it a strong site. But I think what, you know, what's really extremely helpful um, it, it's not helpful. It's it's everything. Um, is that first of all we have amazing presenters. The power of the platform comes from our amazing speakers. And I'm I have like two courses out of the 1600 or 1400 that we've offered. 1400 topics. I'm an extremely small part of it. So the power of the platform comes from our speakers. But it's also the what's also amazing. And I mentioned my wife coming from this background of being um, a career educator and, and, and working in admin and in, in her case for low performing schools. It's, it's a pretty thankless job, what she does. Most people are. Um, it's a sad it's a sad situation when you look at the education system. It's it's sad. You want to fix it. And it's hard. It's impo- it's very I shouldn't say impossible. It is hard. I, on the other hand, go out and provide free education that's meant for lead generation, and I get thanked about 400 times a day by people. And um, so it is extremely validating, and I think what's most surreal about the whole thing, to answer your question, is are the number of people that that I get notes from or that say things about how much it's changed their career, Um how they look at education differently. Um, I know that I wouldn't be in business if, if the clients that are speaking weren't selling. 
And when you go beyond how many people just love the classes to think that, oh my gosh, people are, are purchasing, people are buying cost segregation studies because of this platform and purchasing all kinds of stuff that, uh, that our educators are speaking about, that part's pretty surreal. Because, um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a good feeling to be, I mean, to be totally, to be totally blunt. It's a great feeling. And I am very grateful for um, our speakers, for our attendees, for my employees, um, my family for supporting me. Um, and, you know, all I could do is just continue to try to keep this as viable as possible and to stretch my own thinking and not make the fateful mistake of so many organizations, which is getting stuck in your own way. And I think that, you know, going back to your original question, what I think often makes companies like mine um, able to compete with larger firms or to be able to fend for against competitors um, is the whole the whole theory of David versus Goliath. It's like the question is, which one is which one's better suited for success? Is it David or is it Goliath? And I think that the advantage that we have is our is how small we are. Mm-hmm. Is the fact that I work out of my basement, literally, um, and that I'm not stuck in my ways, and I'm not like a state CPA society where you know I've been. My whole business model is based on charging you know our members so they can get a discount on paid CPE. I mean. I think that would be a really scary position to be in, which is stuck in a traditional business model while the world around you is changing. And uh, so I'm, you know, if there's anything to be upset about, um, I think it's it maybe not not paying attention to what's going on outside the profession because it was clear uh, to me, especially if you look at, uh, I mean, a great analogy of this is actually, are actually universities at this point. I mean, universities are, are have a, major threat. All second tier universities should be extremely nervous right now. Um, And that is because uh, of MOOCs, massive open online courses, because of the, you know, the highest learning institutions that are giving away their content as as record paces uh, for free. Um, And that is their number one commodity. Uh, How could you not be shaking in your boots um, if that's the case? Scott. Scott. Can you share with our listeners the validation that you got by being invited to the AICPA roundtable and what that felt like? Sure. Yeah, that there's another surreal moment there. Um, I, I, I was uh, so it's uh, what you're referring to is an event that's held annually in the the winter, an invite only event where uh, C level executives are asked to to join and, and talk to each other as well as the press and others uh, about their own business and, and, and um, really based on, uh, really it's software companies uh, that are, uh, I think, making the biggest uh, changes or uh, um, inspiring some of the biggest changes in the accounting profession on the software side, which is really, where, in my opinion, where the action is. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I was invited uh, to do that, uh, um, to participate a couple of times. And I think what probably one of the most surreal moments was standing up uh, in front of my group, a group of um, the most highly respected people in the profession, including the head of the AICPA and, and others, and having, you know, the five minutes to tell my story um, and just wondering, is it OK to tell this story? I mean, is it OK? I mean, um, I just didn't know how well it would be received um, to go into, you know, AICPA offices to say this is how we're giving away content and why. And I don't know if I was going to get thrown out for saying something like that. Um, but uh, I think that will go down. Uh, it, and it went nothing like that. It was it was an amazing experience. And I'm grateful for um, having the opportunity to, to participate. Um, that was probably the most validating feeling that I've had to date. And I think that. If you want to, I know you didn't ask this, but you know, I um, I don't, I I don't fit in a, a category. I'm not the press. I'm not a software company. I'm not a marketing. I'm not part of AIM. I'm not part of like the marketing organization. It's like I often do feel. Um, I don't know if isolated is the right word, but I don't know who my peer group is. Um, and so when something like that does happen, it it, it is extremely validating. But I think what's 
what's surprising is it doesn't happen that often. You know, I, I do work and I, I shouldn't, that, that sounds awful the way I said it. Um, it's, uh, it's an anomaly. I'm not the type that goes to networking events all over the country all the time. I work very much in, in Denver where I live and I travel as little as possible. And, um, you know, so when I, when I do get out and, and, um, get to go to, uh, things like that, it's, uh, it's one of those, I, I it's like being among, uh, in my case, it, it felt like being among, uh, the celebrities of the, it, it was, you are among the celebrities in the profession. It's scary and it's intimidating and it's exciting and it's like the best thing ever. It's a special moment. It absolutely is. Um, Scott, I want to thank you for sharing your story with our listeners. From a marketing perspective, you've been quite the pioneer in the education business within the accounting industry. And I encourage our podcast listeners, if you haven't already, to please visit CPA Academy. It's cpaacademy.org. Uh, it is a wonderful service that he provides. Again, if you haven't picked up, it is free to you to get either continuing education or CPE credits. It's a wonderful education experience, and uh, Scott's been quite the pioneer uh, if you weren't aware of this in advance of today's session. But uh, um, I, I do think he's, he's been a wonderful um, innovator and disruptor in our industry for your benefit. And uh, I'm glad he was uh, nice enough to share the story with you. And uh, thanks, Scott. I really appreciate it. And you've been phenomenally successful. Congrats. Thank you, Hugh. It was a, it was a, I very much appreciate the invite to be here. And um, it was always nice catching up with you. And uh, thanks for inviting me to your podcast. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this conversation with Scott Zaret on how he found a gap in the marketplace and used it to forge his own business. If you liked this episode, make sure to subscribe to the Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and consider leaving us a review to let us know how we're doing. In next week's episode, we'll be talking with Dominique Molina, the president and founder of the American Institute of Certified Tax Planner. We'll talk about how she uses tax planning as a solution to differentiate her practice and how that inspired her to start the AICTP, an independent nonprofit corporation which trains and certifies tax professionals in proactive tax planning. <music>